Hey guys, welcome back. I'm Eric Shoji, professional volleyball player and libero for Team USA. I'm here to react to and analyze different volleyball matches from around the world in hopes of inspiring, educating, and having fun with volleyball nerds just like me from all over the world. So if you love volleyball just as much as I do, subscribe to my channel so you can see my videos every week. All right, guys, I hope you're having a great day. I am so excited for today's video, but it's gonna take a little bit of explaining and a little bit of background. So as most of you know, in America, we have NCAA women's and men's volleyball. These are most of the matches that you see on TV or on YouTube, and I've covered them in my channel a couple of times. We have over 300 Division I women's volleyball NCAA teams, but only roughly around 30 Division I and two NCAA men's volleyball teams. That being said, there is a whole nother organization for college volleyball. And this is the National Collegiate Volleyball Federation, or the NCVF, and it is home to over 700 college volleyball teams, which is insane. I will post the link to their website in the description box below. And in fact, there are more men's teams in this organization than women's teams because there is less opportunity for men's to play college volleyball. So this is called Collegiate Club Volleyball. And to be honest, I didn't know much about it before I made this video, but I wanted to react to this game because one, I think the talent is pretty freaking good. And two, I wanted to highlight and promote club volleyball to young volleyball players who might not get recruited by the NCAA teams want to go to their dream school who doesn't have an NCAA team, or maybe they fall in love with volleyball in college and they don't have a team there. So I'm so excited to watch this match today. With over 700 teams, the NCVF provides opportunities for student athletes to compete at the collegiate level, travel and compete in conferences, and ultimately compete for that national championship. I'm also super excited to be joined by a very special guest today who is very, very familiar with the world of the NCVF. His name is Antonio King, and he is the head coach for the number 19 ranked Colorado Boulder men's volleyball club team. Now, Antonio played collegiate club volleyball himself in Minnesota before becoming a coach at Minnesota State and now at Colorado Boulder. So Antonio has been in the world of the NCVF for some years now, and I'm so excited to hear about his knowledge and passion for the game during this video. Antonio, welcome, and thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you know, NCBF is this huge organization that I've been fortunate to play in when I went to college, uh, Minnesota State, Mankato, uh, played Division II, and uh, that just, it was actually called NERSA back then, which is way different than what it's called now. <laughs> But yeah, a lot of the stats that you read off are very much true. A large size of people and teams from different schools all kind of congregate to play the national championship at the end of the year, which is typically in April, in different cities, uh, Denver, Kansas City, Reno, all over the country. So really looking forward to diving in and being able to look at some of the top talent uh, as it concerns teams in the organization so we can help educate and teach and grow the sports more. That's so awesome. I'm so excited to watch. So today, Antonio is going to be taking us through the men's final from the 2019 NCVF championship between Illinois and Cal Poly Slow, two teams that don't have NCAA men's volleyball teams. I'm going to be analyzing and reacting like I normally do, and also answering some questions from Antonio along the way. So Antonio, are you ready to watch some volleyball? Let's do it. Okay, this crowd. <laughs> They're having a lot of fun. I wonder why. This is amazing to see, though, and something super special, and it's not NCAA Volleyball. Great pass. Great tool off the block. Great play over that middle. By the way, Illinois is in white and Cal Poly is in black. Okay, bounce down the line. Nice float serve, great pass. Woo! Okay, Eric, major question that I think is gonna come from a lot of people. You're at a high level of play. You've got attacks and serves coming at you that are like 80 miles an hour. <laughs> You're on the line. Sometimes that hard grip ball down the line is pretty difficult to get, but I think, and this is just a coach's perspective, I definitely want to learn yours, 
it's probably a little harder when you have a ball that's hit maybe two or three feet to your right from that line or to the left from that line. So what are you technically doing as a libero to put yourself in a better position to dig a little more inside the court than maybe your position was set up to do? Well, I think volleyball is changing a little bit. We used to get to the line and work our way in. But right now, what I'm really working on is finding space outside of that block and being right outside that left hand. Also, you need to know your hitter and their tendencies. But as far as positioning, find space outside the block, get in front of the ball as best as you can, create space with your body, and you're going to put yourself in a great position. So don't feel like you have to always get to the line. You feel like you want to get outside of the block and putting yourself in that best position to see the ball when they contact it. Woo! That was out! Great control. Great set, Libero. Nice control in that cover. I love that. And ended with the tool. That wrist away, okay. Oh, libero serving, that's interesting to see. That's something different. There's that hit down the line, blocker kind of forced him out. Was that in? No. Oh, you could see that passer kind of swooped a little bit with his platform. I would have loved for him to just hold it there, set his angle, forget about it, and be solid through it. Let's actually go back and look at that. That's a really good totally. A couple of things, right? Eric just talked about holding his platform a little bit longer, which I agree with. Might have given him a little bit of a better result. But block, take note of kind of what happens when you end up serving your outside hitter. This is something we actually train quite a bit at CU Boulder is to attack the live passer. Because we did a pretty interesting study that showed most of the time, if we serve that outside passer upside and in, a lot of the instances they would pass maybe a less than ideal ball. And in most cases, that attacker didn't end up getting set. So you would hear a lot of us talk about things like, how do we get our team or the opposing team out of system with a serve? Out of system doesn't mean just serving an ace. Best case scenario. But if we can eliminate someone to make an attacking option, that makes it much easier for teams to be able to convert on a transition point like they did in this play. Just out of bounds. Kind of swept his platform there. Great play off the block. Okay. Setter trying to be tricky. Nice hand pass, great extension up. Middles, take note of that. Look at the amount of space that Illinois' middle is kind of creating from this setter. Creating space from your setter makes the opposing block have to work that much harder to find you. And I hope we see that be a continual theme of the way Illinois runs their middle attack by creating more space, making it harder for the opposing team to stop them. Let's see if that happens in the rest of the video. A little bit tight. Is that a block out? Nope, no touch. Wow, he got that outside of the block. That was impressive. Was that the libero diving in there? That's insane. Ah! Gotta convert these transition points. Another service error. And another one. Put it away. There we go. Way to be strong with that overpass. Great set again. That setter's doing such a great job of isolating his hitters. Sneaky dump. Nope. Yep. Great effort by that libero though. Great angle on that pass. Shoulders were over. Ah. Second ball contact error for you. What's going through your mind? so that you can help your teammate be successful on the next ball, especially when you have to deliver those out of system sets. Yeah, well, I think, of course, you want to make a hittable ball. And ideally, it's going to be high, unless the hitter calls for a faster set, and it's going to be a little bit inside. Think two to three feet inside the pin. That's what we're aiming for on the national team. So high, inside, couple feet off the net, and that's going to give your hitter the best opportunity to score a point. Let me ask you, when you, when you could... Obviously, you're a smart player, just as everybody is on the national team. 
So Thank would you. you do you recognize when a play for your team is a little more broken than maybe ideal, and does that change your mentality as it concerns what your job responsibility is? Absolutely. I think when things are all out of sorts, you're going to want to error high, and you're going to want to error in the middle of the court, depending on what the touch is. So maybe if I'm getting an off dig, but people are on the ground, or you know that my setter, Michael Christensen, is on the back line, I'm going to put that ball high. I'm going to put it on the 10 foot line in the middle of the court, kind of slow things down, allow us to take a deep breath and transition into the next point. And attackers, this is actually a really good lesson for you as well, that last clip we just looked at. When you have an out of system situation, and this is my rule of them, that's pretty general, you never want to attack a well-formed double block. And the person you least want to attack in that double block is the middle blocker. Because they're typically the person taking away most of your opportunity to score and it concerns court space. So the better opportunity is to either find the center to attack if they're in the back row, ideally, or even more so, chop the hands down the line. That makes the team on the opposing side now have to play a bigger area of court because now they have to defend outside of the boundary line as well. So chopping hands down the line if you're out of system proves to be much more advantageous than trying to challenge that 6 eight middle blocker. We'll try to get that a little bit higher with your hand. This middle. Who is he? Oh, he tried for that short serve. That looked in. You are in a position internationally where the libero cannot serve. So you literally can't contribute much to the offense, unfortunately. When your team goes through those spouts of maybe three, four service errors in a row, especially because the men's level internationally, it's high risk, high reward serve. So how do you, as a person that maybe is in a position that can't contribute from the service line, how do you help your team get past that mental funk they might be in after having four, three missed serves in a row? Yeah, well, I think there's two things. The first is that um, I'm gonna try and be positive no matter what in these situations. Give the guy a high five, pat him on the butt, say next play. And I think overall that positive attitude will just help people move along knowing we all make mistakes. A service error is the same as a hitting error. It's the same as getting an ace. So you, everyone makes mistakes, but also I think if I'm able to move on to the next play and communicate and talk about what's next, then that server who made that error is also gonna move on more easily than if nobody talked to him at all. With the ace. Another out of system ace. I haven't served since 2008, you guys. Ah, the error. Who is that middle? What is this celebration? Again, right inside that block. Would you agree that that type of play, regardless of maybe how set up that you are, your block is, that you just have to say, hey, Hats off because that kill was was great. Move on to the next point. One hundred percent. I mean, I think at the professional level, especially, they're ripping balls, they're pounding balls. You can't do about anything about it sometimes. So on a hit like that, where the block is good, the libero is in a great position, and he bounces in front of you. Bravo. Next point. Let's move on. Nice hand pass. Ooh, exploiting that seam. What a serve! That was a sick serve down the line. Jeez, these middles on both teams are very impressive. Great up! I think that was the middle. A little bit wide. Great spot on defense. Okay, with speed to the pin. I have a question for you here because we've seen a couple different changes now. So in this match so far, we've seen a hybrid of float serves. We've seen a hybrid of topspin serves. If you're in a match that has various levels of serve, various types of serves, what are you doing mentally to prepare for how you maybe technically receive those two types of serves differently? Well, I think the first is that I'm fortunate enough to have 
so much in my scouting report, so much video that we watched, so much time spent studying servers. So I'm not sure how much time these guys are watching video. That being said, you need to keep your eye on the server. You need to look what they're doing, what their toss is, what their approach is. And there's always little, little cues that you can pick up on, such as a bad toss or dropping their elbow. And that's gonna allow you to pick up the serve quicker and be ready for any serve that comes at you. I'm someone who doesn't move up too much for float serves to take it with my hands. So I'm generally in the same position on the court. Now, if you're a hand passer, you're gonna really wanna see these cues and pick it up early so you can figure out if you need to stand up forward or move back in the court. Do you find yourself being more comfortable with your hands or more comfortable with your platform? And how do you get comfortable <laughs> with the other? Well, I am pretty much 99.5% a platform passer. Obviously the hand passes happen every once in a while, but I grew up in old school volleyball where we couldn't pass with our hands. So I am much more comfortable with my platform. I try to practice it every once in a while with my hands, but also understand that my feet have to be on point at most of the time in the games to be able to get on my platform. Speaking of technique, let's rewind the clip just a little bit and look at kind of what the setup for Illinois does to kind of get this ball out of the pen. Really good technique. A lot of setters tend, especially when they pull off the net or pull 30 feet back, they tend to kind of fold into their core, rely too much in their core to help the ball gain distance. You'll see him stay nice and tall, deliver a quick ball using his hand and his wrist and his triceps to speed up the tempo. And you actually will see that he actually converts on this ball. Right there, great set. Ooh, get that a little bit higher. Is that an error? Ah, these errors. There we go, using that seam. What's, ha what's happening, what's happening? Free ball, great free ball pass. Woo, that's a monster block. There we go, that's a better angle right there. Cal Poly with the blocking right now. There's the back one. Love to see that misdirection. Change it up just a little bit. Yes, defense. And the block. <gasps> Oh my gosh, that was a sick save. I don't even know what happened, but that was a sick play. A little bit low. Great hit, sharp cross. Okay, Libero taking space, nice job. Woo, the rip. That block is drifting just a little bit. Great fight off, that's a tough ball. Ah, could he have done something better with that? I agree with you. I think he, he recognized that maybe the set wasn't as good as it could have been. I would have loved to have seen that setter stay a little taller in his delivery as opposed to kind of relaxing in, in his back to let his wrist do more of the work there to get that ball to target, but absolutely agree. The right side could have maybe figured out how do I reset that ball, right? I know you talk a lot, Eric, about recycling the ball, letting your teammates kind of pick up on that, that ball recovery so you can recycle and do something different. Is that something that you think could have probably worked in that example? Yeah, I think so. To be honest, there weren't a lot of people around to cover, but if you are out of system, out of position, a great place to try and replay it off the block. So tipping into the block, getting ready down and cover. The other option is to put it on the opponent's setter. You're, you're gonna see in international volleyball, out of system plays, all these kinds of crazy plays, and the ball is always going to the setter. And that's just to create a little bit of chaos, more out of system for the opposing team and giving yourself the best advantage in maybe an uncertain time. Eric talked about a lot of good stuff there. And I think the big takeaway is how do you make your team's inevitable disadvantage your opponent's disadvantage, right? And he just talked about, okay, we cause a little disruption on the opposing side. 
That's called a really high volleyball IQ. That's what helps expand your ability to play or recognizing how to disrupt and put yourself and your teammates back in the driving positions where you can ultimately capitalize on scoring that point. Great angle. Oh, just a little bit over, but the technique was there. Here we go. <gasps> the solo stuff. Here we go. Great step. Oh, Setter trying to be tricky. Nice. Uh, libero kill. No, 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 no. What? Ending with that middle going oh, wrist away again. Are you serious? Take that step a little bit bigger. Bounce down the line. Ah, that's a couple of errors by the libero on serve. Sign him up for Team USA. Who is that? He's a monster at the net. Ah, a little bit too much reach there. A little bit too much reach. I think it was out of system. He knew it was going to that pin, but his feet didn't quite get there. And that's why he reached and got tooled. Yeah, and, I, and that's actually, I'm going to give credit to Cal Poly Center on that because you see a lot of centers who are maybe younger in experience who tend to do what I like to call sharing the ball in distribution if that rally is continued. So they'll set the outside at the same rally. If that doesn't work, they'll go to the middle. If that doesn't work, they'll go to the right side. What tends to happen there is a lot of your smarter blockers start to recognize that pattern very quickly and will just go anticipating where you're going to share the ball. But he does a really good job of repeating that set, which I think actually caused Illinois' middle blocker to be slightly late and slightly late enough to where he was able to convert on that high-end kill. Holy, 24-24. Back one, sneaks it by the, he snuck it by the block. In the seam, great play. Woo, these are looking in. Oh my gosh, these guys are ripping. I'm so impressed with how fearless they are. Okay, this back one, no. That was for the second set. Oh, no, it wasn't. Great cover, everyone ready. Yes, set or dump. Oh God, oh gosh. They are playing with some speed and I'm here for it. Go. Ah. Feel like he could have taken one more step. Great play off the block there. No. So we want our sets tight and inside, like I talked about a little bit earlier, but that is the risk. Sometimes it's going to go over. And why we aim inside is that if it does go over, hopefully it'll be on the in the court. So I think he just risked a little bit too much, tried to get a little bit too perfect and overset it. Plus it was set point, And I think he had a lot of adrenaline going on there. Well, let's talk about that a little more, Eric. I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of, you know, the rule of thumb, maybe being five by five, five feet off, maybe five feet inside around a system ball. How do you learn in your career? Because you play positions in the middle back, you play positions in left back, and occasionally you pop in on the right back to play defense. How have you learned how to deliver a second ball from all the areas of the court that you've been in? Practice, practice, practice. Put yourself in the weirdest spots. Toss the balls from the weirdest spots. Put yourself all over the court and take rep after rep after rep. That's the only way because you're going to get that ball in a, in a game that you're not comfortable with. That's just how volleyball works. So get out there on the court, hundreds of setting reps all over the, all over the court, have someone toss to you and get comfortable with it because it's going to happen in the game. And if you can deliver a second ball, regardless if you're 
Romero, center, heck, even the middles who step in and take some of those second balls. If you can deliver a really good second ball on a system, you're that much more valuable. Cal Poly wins the second set. So now we're going to the third set, the decider. I love this crowd. It reminds me of college so much and I miss it. All right, here we go, third set, deciding set. Okay, with the bounce cross court to start. I really want to take a look at that again because that is a really difficult thing to do. He creates, with the middle creates a little space in the center. He's in a two hitter rotation right now. So the block on the opposing side knows to just block straight in front of him and straight in front of the center because those are the two people who are probably going to be the most dangerous in that moment of play. Center gives him a really good ball on top of his head and he takes that ball back to area one where his opening is because the block's not there. So really good job of recognizing his strong shot in that case is area one and surprise, gets the kill. Let's see, it gets up and turns in midair. That's such a sick shot. That's Dave Smith-esque. Ooh, what that long distance set. There's an inside ball, a little bit too inside maybe. I think the hitter probably could have got his feet there just a little bit better. I mean, I'm a little bit biased towards liberos, but it was high, it was inside. Make sure you get there with your feet hitter so that you can take a rip at it. And that's actually another really good example of maybe why we don't want to challenge that well formed double block. He's brought inside just a little bit and the center is right behind him. So I would have loved to have seen him just maybe roll a shot that ball at the center who's, who's expecting it, but that's okay. Because once that center takes the first ball, ultimately it makes it a little easier for your team to deal with because now you're only dealing with two hitters to block versus three. So I would love to see him maybe figure out a more strategical place to place that ball to put his team back into the driver's seat there. Yeah, that left foot just never quite got there on that approach. Great pass, love that hand extension. Snuck it through the block again, he's quick. Yes, libero, I wanna know who you are. Sick up. Woo! What a cover, are you kidding? Great control. Ah, with that error. Eric, we've seen this a couple times here to where if you're watching that libero defensively, and I'm sure Cal Poly's libero on the opposing side is doing the same, at your level of play, we've seen some difference in terms of how people stand defensively to defend the ball. In the men's level, I think you see a lot of people playing with their hands apart to play space. And maybe in some other levels, you see people playing with their hands together automatically. Tell me, what are your thoughts? Are you, are you in the camp of hands apart, play bigger space? Or are you in the camp of just kind of sync together and kind of hope you can get your arms there? Well, I will say that I'm working a lot on defense right now, and I'm working a lot on hands being apart, a little bit wider, uh, just creating more surface area for the ball to hit, I think, at the professional level. And even at the collegiate level, balls are coming so fast that you don't have time to create a platform or to get your platform together. So creating some space for the ball to hit is always a great idea. Now, if you have the chance or the option to create a platform and control the ball, that is 100% what you need to do because I have seen some players, including myself, where our arms are apart, but we just don't get them together for some reason on easy balls and we create a touch that's not that great. So surface area, but if you can control it, get your platform together and control the ball. Agreed. And that's also a really different perspective of protecting your face. We don't want you to have your hands, in most cases, automatically linked here when you've got a hard ball coming at you because it may not always be in the center of your bread basket. So having your hands apart makes it much easier to defend your face should you need to, as well as play more service area like Eric just talked about, increasing your opportunity to actually dig that ball. Absolutely. And I have learned that lesson in the hard way. Ah, serves there. Okay, again, again. Go. Ah, could they have read that better? I'm not sure. 
smart shot, hats off to that attacker. He recognized he may not have been in the best position to score, saw a really good, well-formed double block, and just said, you know what, I'm going to cause some disruption and roll it, and right at the campfire. Great angle, great left foot drop. Again, who is this? Send me a message. You're getting on Team USA this year. Oh, they had that block up. Let's talk about that block for that libero position again. I'd like, love to make your perspective. Near end, the opponent's in a two-hitter rotation, meaning your left front blocker and your team and your middle blocker know to just, hey, if we can get as many hands in that middle blocker and the opposing side, the better. What are you doing positionally as a libero as you see your left front blocker and your middle front blocker up on the same ball in the middle? I think in general, you're going to want to create space again. So maybe you can be outside of the block ready for tips, or also you can be deep, kind of behind the block, ready for touches. So depends on the player. I think in general, you're going to want to be outside of that left hand, ready for a sharp or a tip. Great hit, great tool. Solo. Solo blocking. Defender, libero, you see one block up on your team to handle the outside. Are you charging defensively? Are you moving into the court? What's your mind telling you in the solo block situation? Depends how scared I am that game. No, um, <laughs> you know, I always try to play the odds. So if I'm going to step forward, what are the odds that I'm going to dig that straight down spike? I think I have to know my opponent. I have to know my own feeling in the moment. But in general, if you're further back, given yourself depth, you're gonna have more time to dig the ball. So if there's a hitter that's gonna hit straight down, hats off, give them the point. But maybe, just maybe one time, they're gonna hit it deeper onto the line. And that's where you're gonna have more time if you have more depth. So take your chances. I mean, you gotta weigh your options and figure out if, if you feel that you can dig that hitter with their straight down hit. Great. Oh, ooh. Nice touch, nice touch. Nice pass. Was that a tool? Yes, he got the tool. Ah! Nice deep swing. 8-7 at the switch. All right, Cal Poly's on our side. Nice pass, Libero. Inside play. Change it up. I love to see that. Yeah, and that's a really good example of why it's so important, blockers, to make sure you know where your hitters are at every moment. Absolutely. That one moment will come up, much like this in the third set, where that team decides, I'm going to change this route up just a little bit. And he moved inside, and that blocker on the opposing side of Cal Poly, Cal Poly excuse me, didn't recognize quick enough that, uh oh, my hitter's not doing what he's normally doing. He's doing something different. So always check your hitters, regardless of the time of match, regardless of the speed of the play, always know what's happening in case something creeps up at the worst moment. Oh, we got it right through that block. Libero jump serving again on this team. Sick up. Love it. Ah, oh, let's get a swing out of that. Nice up, Libero. See, he hedged forward and still got that dig. And the put away. We got some yellow socks going. Oof. Great pass. Monster block. That's really good. That was a sick Dylan block there. recognized, finally, hey, Cal Poly's middle is over there. I need to get in front. So you saw them read, made the adjustment, dove into that uh, that area five yes. angle, took it away, got the stuff blocked. Oh, and the service error right after that. 11 11. This is insane. Done with that guy. Again, a service error. Wow, Cal Poly with the block. 
to pull ahead, 13, 12. These service errors are killing me. Nice pass. Transition. All right, causing a little bit of trouble. The barrel, nice up. Great off blocker defense. This play is great. What's happening? Right, this little barrel has three dig. Ah, oh, and they hit it out at the end. Nudge point. Wow, the ballsy back one set on match point. Great pass, way to keep your shoulders forward. Center serving, match point again. Straight over. <laughs> 15 all. Nice push out. Where was the cover? Match point for Illinois now. Great sick pass, so steady. Chance for Illinois. And they got the block. Great cover, this libero is everywhere. I need to take notes. Oh, they snuck it through that seam just a little. Did he hit it out? Did he hit it out? No. Tool. Okay, so, Eric, wow. you've been in these moments before where it's down to the wire, two points separating <laughs> your team or your opponent's team from maybe that championship match or that high level match. In your head, are you thinking about how do I not make a mistake or, or, or what's your mentality in that moment of a match? Well, I'll first say that I've been on both sides, the winning and the losing. So I am speaking from experience, but you have to try and get those negative thoughts out, out of your head. And that is very challenging for all players, in my opinion. So what I like to do these days is go back, do my routine, take a couple deep breaths, say some positive things to myself in my head, and then rely on my technique. I put a lot of training in for all the matches that I play, and that's what I fall back on when I get nervous or when there are these tight moments. It's always been kind of like a mental rule of thumb for me as I'm coaching to kind of help encourage those moments that happen inevitably to just take a deep breath and go back to the simple things that you know will help you get the result that you want to accomplish. Don't overcomplicate it. Do what's been working for you. Focus on if it's for passing, focus on getting stopped. If it's for swinging, focus on just reaching high. If it's for setting, focus on getting your feet there. The small things that you know help you get there uh, will help you achieve some of those crucial moments when it's 17 17 for you in the third or fifth set. I like that great technique. A little tight, but that setter. How tall is that setter? He got up and got that set. Match point. And the solo stuff to end it. What a sick game. What a crowd. 17-15 in the fifth, in the fifth, in the third. Congrats to Cal Poly. Wow, that was an awesome match. So exciting. 17-15 in the third and pretty dang high quality. I'm super, super impressed. And watching matches like this really reminds me of why I started this channel in the first place. And that is to show people volleyball from all over the world. I am so inspired by all kinds of volleyball and all types of volleyball players. So Antonio, thank you so much for messaging me and making this video possible. I also just really wanted to show young volleyball players, mostly in America, that you don't have to play in the NCAA to play collegiate volleyball. You can play for the NCBF. And as you can see, it's pretty freaking sick. So Antonio, thank you again. If you have anything else to say, I would, lo I would love to hear it. Yeah, you know, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. This is a really good example of how there are more opportunities to play outside of high school, even if that doesn't necessarily mean going to a division one, division two, division three, 
NAIA sanctioned a volleyball program at a school. There's a ton of programs, both at the men's level, collegiately club wise, and at the women's level, collegiately club wise, where you can still have very similar experiences around traveling, team bonding, and getting to hopefully claim some hardware at the end of the year. So hopefully we're able to definitely enlighten you and show you that places like CU Boulder and other areas in the country definitely have college club opportunities. So if you're in a route to go to college or are currently there and are seeking to play at that next level, take a look at your club recreation sports and see if something exists there. Exactly. Antonio, so awesome. Thank you for all that information. Thank you for being here with me. My first video collab. I'm so excited and I hope to hear from you soon. See ya. Bye. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed that video. I know I did. I hope you have a great day. Get out, play some volleyball, have some fun, and I'll see you all soon. Peace.